Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, a podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels. And I am calling in today from the car once again, which we have taken to calling our home office. And I'm Eve Yohalem, also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue, which is coming out in May, and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. And I'm recording from my son's bedroom. <laughs> in each episode of this podcast, we explore a book-related musing, something we've been dying to know that has something to do with books. Today's episode was Julie's idea. This was months ago before there was any hint of a quarantine or any kind of pandemic. Julie came to me and she was very excited to interview a fellow named Jim Mustick, who had written a book called A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die. So Julie, maybe you can explain a little bit more about the book that Jim wrote. Absolutely. I saw A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die in the bookstore and I opened it up and I started reading and I just thought, I have got to own this book because what Jim does is for each book that he's recommending, each of the thousand, he has these fabulous, really well written, really thoughtful essays. And then he also recommends books to read if you like the book that he's recommending. And he has these fabulous indices at the back or indexes, whatever the, what's the plural of index? Absolutely no clue. (laughs) (laughs) At the back where he says, Things like, here are 10 books to read if you want something funny, that sort of thing. So I just thought this was an incredible resource. I have here, Eve, um, mm-hmm. I have here an example of an oh, essay. Oh, good. good. I-, I was going to interrupt you and just swoon a little bit because the <laughs> essays themselves are not just beautifully written, they're thoughtful. They inspire you to want to read the book. I can't really do justice to the way Jim writes, both in the book and in his newsletters. But if you have an example, maybe people can get just a tiny taste. Yes. Okay. So I just printed one of the essays to read from. This is about a book called A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. So here is what Jim Mustick has to say. A month in the country may be as poised and perfect as fiction gets. Inspiration, atmosphere, and expression harmonize with an ease and expressiveness that leave a lovely, indelible image in the minds and hearts of its readers. Wow. Then Jim summarizes a little bit about the author, and then he says, At the outset of A Month in the Country, Tom Birkin, a World War I survivor and a veteran of a broken marriage, arrives in a remote Yorkshire village to restore a medieval mural in the local church. Setting up his summer abode in the bell tower, he is charmed by the blooming countryside even as he passes his days absorbed in resurrecting an anonymous artist's apocalyptic vision. It is, of course, Birkin's own restoration to faith in life that Carr tellingly portrays through a season of consolation and renewal that's enduring despite its swift passage. Simple in outline and wonderfully well-written, a month in the country is hauntingly beautiful in its effect. So he gives you all the factual information that you need to decide if you want to read the book. But then he also gives you a flavor of the book. He gives you more than that. So you know if you need to read the book on a visceral level. And that's what's so great. Yes. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about Jim himself. Mm -hmm. And then we can get to our interview with him. Jim began his career in book selling at an independent bookstore in Briarcliff Manor, New York in the early 80s. And then he co-founded an acclaimed book catalog called A Common Reader and was for 20 years its guiding force. Then he was an editorial and product development executive in the publishing industry. So we reached out to Jim and I was so excited when he said that he would come into the city and he met with us in person and we got a chance to interview him. And we began by asking how he got started with this project. In the early 2000s, a man named Peter Workman, who was the founder of Workman Publishing, published a book called 1,000 Places to See Before You Die by Patricia Schultz, which was fabulously successful. He had the idea of doing other books in this vein. And he was aware of the work I was doing at the time, running a book catalog, and he was a big fan of it. And we were friends. And one evening over dinner, he said, 
you know, I, I'd like to do one of these books about books, but you like to write it. And with enthusiasm and not enough forethought, I said, yes, of course. <laughs> did and he include the word 1000 when he pitched well, he the did, project? He did. Patricia Schultz would tease me several times a year saying, how's it going? When are you going to be finished? And I would say, well, why couldn't you have made it 500 places to see before you die? So in any case, I signed a contract for the book and I then spent 14 years working on it. In addition to the thousand books proper, each of the essays has an end note in which I list other books by the same author or other books on the same subject or other books that I think you should try, book recommendations, if you like the one that's on the page you're looking at. Because I knew that many readers would pick up my book, and while I hoped they would discover new reading, I knew the first thing they were going to do is look for the books they already loved and ah, knew. interesting. Um, I did that. <laughs> yeah, I, every, everyone does. That's what I would do. And so you want to make sure your favorite is in there. It was. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> when they're in there, I wanted to give people some lead to something based upon that knowledge. So what else might a reader who liked Jane Austen or Dorothy Dunnett or Dashiell Hammett, what are some other books that they might not know about that would be rewarding for them to discover? All of that work had to be done and collected and kept track of. It was quite an enormous undertaking. And from the beginning, it was difficult. How do you even start? If you imagine walking into a library that's filled with hundreds of thousands of books and going back through history, you're talking about millions of books. Several hundred thousand books are published each year. Do you do it chronologically? Do you do it in terms of the most popular books of all time? Do you do it by some kind of rubric for the most influential or the best books of all time? So how did you narrow that list of millions down to a thousand? Well, I started to think about how can I make the book useful to a reader? And then I thought about what actually goes into a reading life. I don't think we read all the time in the same way or with the same character or in the same mood. We read the way we eat so that one day we might have a desire for something very healthful. And then the next day, we really want to have a hot dog. And then we read different things at different times of our lives. Good Night Moon and Where the Wild Things Are are in my book. And then you could go all the way to, you know, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking about grief and death. And I wanted mostly to make sure the book had a sense of the fun of browsing. So the book in the thousand titles, about half are fiction, half are nonfiction. It ranges in time from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was inscribed on tablets in Babylon 4,000 years ago, to the most recent book in it, which is a book called Life in Code, A Personal History of Technology by a writer named Ellen Ullman. So I finally said, with those kinds of overarching principles, what if I had a bookstore and I could only have a thousand books in it and I wanted to have something for everyone. So that sense of the reader and then of the browsing and being on the hunt is kind of really what allowed me to narrow it down. How much did you take into account as you were selecting the books, the background or the demographics of the authors when you were deciding what should be chosen for the list? I tried to get a good mix across time, across borders, across all the elements of identity, gender, ethnicity, race, and so on. Part of the issue is that there are thousands of years where the available material is very limited in terms of who is writing. Now that the book is out in the world, I'm sure you've gotten lots of feedback on the list. Are there books that people are surprised to see there? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> surprised to see there and more surprised not to see yes, there. Yes, tell us. Once people know you're writing a book called 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, you can never enjoy a dinner party in quite the way you did before. Right. <laughs> because everyone there who's a reader is asking, is this in? Is that in? I knew from the beginning that this book could not be authoritative or comprehensive and should not pretend to be. One of the things that I loved while we were talking to Jim is that 
He made it very clear that he wants people to disagree with him. He wants to learn about new books from other people and to prompt conversation, which is for book lovers. Well, I was going to say the best thing. No, the best thing is actually reading the books. The second best thing is talking to other people about the books. So I was really interested when he told us about his website, A Thousand Books to Read. You can go to the website and you can comment on the books that he's chosen. You can agree or disagree with what he's chosen. And you can add your own books. You can craft basically your own list, which is fun. He wrote this book and now he has a website that allows people to talk to him about the books that he thinks we should all read before we die. And also allows anyone who wants to, to suggest other books to read before you die. So he's pulled all of these people into the conversation. And of course, what's great about the internet is anyone who wants to can play along. And, and yes, he, he started events yes. that allow people to weigh in. Yes. Here's what he has to say about the live events. My wife came up with this idea called Battle of the Books, where we go to a bookstore or a library in a community. We work with the booksellers or the librarians to identify five people from the community, and they each have to pick a book that's not in my book. They come to the event and they get five minutes each, no more, to explain to the audience why it's a book everybody should read before they die. And after that, we have some banter and some door prizes and all that stuff. And then the audience votes on the presentations and picks the winner from that evening. Oh, that's fun. I have one word for you, first of all, which is Brooklyn. Uh -huh. <laughs> but as, can you tell us some of the books that have won? Mm -hmm. We did one at the Ridgefield Library in Ridgefield, Connecticut. There was a wide range of people presenting, mm -hmm. each of whom brought their own contingent to the audience. Oh, you they know? packed they the audience. The house. <laughs> is, that, about, is that fair? Yes, it's fun. There's, okay, there's okay. about you know, 175 people there on a Thursday night. And unlike Congress, Connecticut. are people willing to change their minds? Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> they let people speak and change their minds. And the books ranged from The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Which, which was not shows, in a thousand which books. Which was not in a thousand books. I have a different Margaret Atwood book. The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe. I have a different Tom Wolfe book. The Fault in Our Stars. But the winner was Devotions, which is the collected poems of Mary Oliver. So it's wonderful to see these range a of book books. Of poetry won. And then have someone basically champion a book of poetry and win That's over amazing. the house. You have a skeptical look on your face, I'm, Julie. I'm what does that many, mean? <laughs> I'm wondering how many people this person brought to the I don't to think the I don't think it was because the house was stacked. The stacking was kind of equal. And so his presentation was great. Mary Oliver is terrific. If you choose the right poem to read of hers, everyone wants to cry or breathe deeply or think about their lives. So there's that kind of effect. And the wonderful thing is the audience was so excited by this. Everyone's kind of on this book high at the end of it. People were emailing us all through the weekend afterwards saying, you know, everybody in town, this is what they're talking about. This is yeah, really, so it's kind of, it's nice to see books take center stage in that way. Oh my God, Julie, a collection <laughs> of poetry won the battle of the books. I know, I know. And I, I have to say, I'm just a little embarrassed by my lack of knowledge about poetry. So I went and looked up some Mary Oliver poems. You did? Should I read? Should yeah. I, I did. Yes, okay. yes, yes. You have one? Okay. okay, read it. I do, I do. Apparently, this is one of her most famous ones. And it's particularly apt, I think, for the time that we're living in. Are you ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The summer day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? 
Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? I love this line. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Isn't that a great juxtaposition? It's it's fantastic. It's really, really fantastic. So, of course, a collection of poems like that won the Battle of the Books. It wouldn't have necessarily, I assume, given the general popularity level of poetry collections, been one that everyone in the audience knew. So, pretty great. Probably not. The other thing that really excited me about his description is that 150 people showed up. I know. I mean, Did you, I to a book event in Connecticut. I know. It's crazy. Of course. And he does them regularly. And you and I talked about going to one in May, and that's not happening at the moment. But we look forward to a time where we can go to a battle of the books. And I went home and thought, how do I get 175 people to my book event? So what do I do? I think you need to just read some Mary <laughs> Oliver poems, maybe. Anyway, going back to our conversation with Jim, after we talked about the Battle of the Books, we started talking about kids and books for kids. And he described a teacher named Dave Griffith, who worked with another teacher, Judy Silver, in Ridgefield High School. They had the idea to ask kids what they want to read. And then they designed a course where that's what the kids read. And it's been enormously successful. They've been doing it for something like nine or 10 years. And I just got very, very excited thinking about that. What would it look like to teach a high school literature class where the syllabus was designed by the high school students? I don't think there would be reading Tess of D'Urbervilles. I don't think so. I really don't. Anyway, so we were talking to Jim about this, and here's how he described it. The engagement of the kids talking about these books is palpable. The energy and vision of the teachers is palpable as well. And so it brings that joy to reading, which I think we kind of sadly often beat out of kids in the classroom by giving them books that they don't have the experience to find resonance in. It always puzzles me that all across America for decades, high school students are reading The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is a wonderful book. I love it. I revere it. But it's hard for me to see what that book could possibly say to a 15-year-old. We do readers a disservice twice, once by having them read it when they don't have the kind of experience of retrospection and regret, which is the soul of the book. They can't have had it because they haven't lived enough. And secondly, They're not going to read it when they're 45, when it might actually resonate with them greatly because they hated it when they were 15. Right. I was lucky enough to interview Philip Pullman about 10 years ago. Uh, He's the author of- That was really lucky. Golden (laughs) Compass. Yes. Yeah, we had a great conversation. I noticed the Golden Compass trilogy is in your book. Yes. (laughs) And we were talking about this very subject. And I had found an article he had written- in a British newspaper about the new UK secondary school English curriculum. And he chose the verbs used in this report about what students were supposed to do. Analyze, explore, explain, all words aimed at a kind of critical appreciation of the text. And then he said, never once is there the word enjoy. Mm. Yeah, And that's what's what really turns us on to reading. If we can get students lost in stories, that's the most powerful thing we could do to make them more sensitive people, more empathic, but also more connected to some kind of passion of theirs. My favorite story in that vein, three separate Supreme Court justices on separate occasions, years apart from each other, in independent interviews, were asked the same question. What first set you on a path toward a life in the law? And It was Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Sonia Sotomayor all said, reading Nancy Drew. With this fabulous new information about our women Supreme Court justices in mind, that was cool information, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. And that the three of them all got inspired by the same series of books. Well, wait a minute. That is a real testament to the power of reading, but it is also a clear statement about a dearth of books about powerful girls. Back then, yes, don't you think? very, very yeah. fair. But what's interesting to me is the question they were asked. It wasn't, what were your favorite books? Mm. It was, what first set you on a path toward life in the law? And the answer was Nancy Drew. That's true. Right. But speaking of a question about what is your favorite book, 
we did ask Jim that question. Yes. And this is what he said. I'll talk about two. They're very different. So it, it's a good conversation. One is, do you know the writer Russell Hoban? Yes. Russell Hoban started out writing kids' picture books, very famous series of books about a badger named Francis. Red yeah. and Jim. Red and Jim for Francis. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he went on to write later in his career, The Mouse and His Child. That's the book that I want to talk about. The Mouse and His Child is a book about a wind-up toy. It's a father mouse who's holding hands with a child mouse. And when you turn a key in the back of the father mouse, he turns around in a circle, lifting the child mouse upside down. And they have all kinds of harrowing adventures. I mean, it's a very scary book. It's kind of dark, but ultimately uplifting, at least to me. And this story and the way it's told has as much to say about what it means to be alive on the earth as any book I've ever read. I okay. think I might have to read that. <laughs> you can really book talk <laughs> well, there you go. a book. <laughs> Gotta and read the, that. The second one, the more conventional choice, is George Eliot's Middle March. I reread that book every few years because I find new things in it. I remember when the first time I read it, I was in college, 19 years old, and I thought then that it was the wisest book I'd ever read, and it has remained so as I've learned how little I knew about what wisdom was when I was 19. So basically, the moral of the story is everybody has to make their own list of what to read before you die. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then maybe compare lists and share lists with each other. Right. I've thought about this a lot because I really was hoping when we reached out to Jim, I said to him in our email for the interview, I'd like to talk about, no, really, what should we read before we die? And I think I wanted him to come with a concrete list, maybe not of a thousand, certainly not of a thousand, but okay, here are the top 50. But of course, he's right. The message that we've heard from him now is that it is an individualized process. And what he has done is give the whole world a resource of, all right, I'll narrow the field for you. I'll narrow it down to a thousand. I'll write these fabulous essays to give you a sense of whether or not you think that one of these thousand is the right next book for you. And for me personally, I think that my goal should be not only to seek out books that I know from some source like this book have a level of quality that I'll feel good about having read, but also to take some steps to challenge myself a little bit to go outside my comfort zone. So those are my takeaways. I think my big takeaway here was this idea of reaching out to friends and family and find out what's on their lists and mm. learn more about books that way. I have a friend who does this incredible thing every year for her birthday. A couple of weeks before her birthday, she posts on Facebook and she says, give me suggestions of books you've absolutely loved, books that have kept you up until three in the morning because you can't stop reading them that have you laughing and crying. You know, so she's mm. very specific about the kind of book she wants. And mm. then, of course, lots of friends post and give suggestions. The first time she did it, I think my suggestion to her was Angle of Repose or, or mm. maybe Crossing to Safety. I go back and forth on those Wallace Stegner books. But people make all different kinds of suggestions. And then not only does she have a list she can read from, but then all of us, all of her friends have this wonderful list of suggestions. And it's so much fun. Yes. Yeah. Well, everyone who's listening, please be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about. And we will try looking into it in a future episode. Also, please reach out to us for, for that reason, for any reason, to tell us your thoughts about what are the books you want to read before you die or anything else book related. You can reach us at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find Jim Mustick at 1000booksToread.com. He's also on Twitter. And many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find me at eveyohallam.com. And you can find me at juliesternberg.com. And don't forget, if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us in iTunes or Stitcher. Happy book dreaming, everyone. Happy book dreaming. Go and listen to book dreams with Julie and me.